so I'll, I'll invite Ken to come up and to uh, start with his presentation. Thanks, Jenna. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank my fellow DMET director, Charles Beaudry, who <laughs> helped a lot with the original six or seven of these. Um, and Charles and I were basically uh, concocted this as something which we felt, would, as, as Jenna said, the industry would benefit from. Charles is, is uh, having been a director and doing other pro bono things, found he was, he was running out of time to participate in something like this, and Jenna kindly, another DMEC director, agreed to help out. And of course, as all of us at my age, we're looking to be able to transition some of the great things we're doing over to a younger generation. So. Treat her nicely, she's very important to me. Um, and I, I would, uh, we're gonna refer, refer you to the, to the uh, bios in the handout for our illustrious speakers today, but one gentleman, our keynote speaker, Richard Shoddy, should be singled out uh, because he's probably the only minerals economic, economist here in the room, he might have been the only one attending the conference, as far as I know. It's a very, very elite club. And Richard, fortunately, has shone his, his skills and attention on the minerals exploration industry and is one of the few, I call, I even cited it yesterday, so I guess he likes the tagline, he holds the book of the dead. He basically looks at our performance as an as a industry and a community in a way that we really should be paying more attention to because we know explorers are all optimists. We are never really wanting to look back at what we've done, we're always wanting to look forward. And yet if we don't look back, we really don't see what we've achieved. And we are usually judged by what we've achieved, not what we think we can do in the future. So uh, Richard has will be presenting a talk today that is uh, crafted, of course, by his hand, but came out of some discussions we had a couple of months ago, where he looked a bit more at, at the subset issues of how technology and geophysics in particular can contribute to minerals exploration uh, discoveries and success. My talk, of course, I, I regard myself as the, as the person, once the wall is up, I go around and try and do fill with some of the cracks that are, are still there. So one of the cracks that I found, that I discovered very early on in my career was, you can't trust geologists to describe how a discovery is made. They're, they're inherently, they're biologically, they're genetically incapable of not lying, but errors of omissions are vast and numerous. And I learned this when the first deposit I ever worked on, Island Copper was emerging as a new discovery for the company I worked for at the time called Utah International, which became part of BH GE and then part of BHP. So, uh, my point is, if we don't measure what we've, what's been done in the past in, a, in somewhat of an analytical way, it's very difficult to know what's been achieved, how it's been achieved, and how to replicate that going forward. So, I'll give you a little, t it's the shortest presentation of the bunch once I shut up. And uh, so we have lots of things to look at, but how do we, if we want to improve it? So there's the, there was the beginning of the mine. It looked like that when I went up there as a student at UBC on the left. And then when it finally finished up, um, that was uh, 1969 uh, actually. And then that's 1995 when they finished the, the mining. And uh, one of the interesting things was that I, I learned that was where a lot of really, really good mining engineers could cut their teeth in porphyry coppers. A lot of the, the, the people that worked there ended up going to Escondida, some of them I think are probably at uh, Olympic Dam now at BHP. And so a mine is more than just a hole in the ground, it's an educational experience for the industry. These are really important things, not just for the economy that it generates for the local community, but training grounds, real places. And likewise for me, I learned a lot. So. I go uh, put the story in the context of the blind mice, trying to characterize something. All going out very diligently doing their measurements, but not at the end of the day, really having a very specific idea of what they're looking at. So they describe it as best they can. Now peek, peek over here. And uh, the major components that I saw 
in the Island Copper experience, and this was in actually interviewing the key people involved, but it was some years after the event. Uh, so we had the prospector who came in and actually made the original discovery. Uh, we had the geologist who diligently mapped in the upper right hand corner. And then we had the geochemist. So the themes that basically were told to me that were important in this was the prospector found an overturned tree with uh, pyrite and calcopyrite in the rock stuck in the tree trunk. He dug down to the bedrock and he found outcropping mineralization. But why did he go there? He went there because the GSC had run an aeromagnetic survey about five years earlier and he was investigating that. Prior to that, there was a number of surveys in the southern part of the island, or mid part of the island, but south of Port Hardy, for scarns. And aeromag is very useful for that. In this particular case, though, the prospector, Gordon Milburn, didn't know what was there, but he knew there was this about well, three kilometer long aeromagnetic anomaly, and when he went and looked in the area, he found some mineralization. One of the other uh, uh, people involved, I'll go to the bottom, bottom right, and it was actually turned out to be my father-in-law eventually, he was enamored with the geochemistry. He felt that the, the soil geochemistry was so important that that was the singular most important thing when you asked them how it was found. And it's true, that probably was because they were drilling that anomaly when they found the deposit. But that wasn't the first one they drilled, they drilled many others. The geology, there was a geologist who came up from Arizona because the local guys weren't that familiar with porphyries in the office, it was a relatively new office. And apparently late in the summer, there was a, a drought and a, an area of a creek that hadn't been accessible before because it was covered with water. This geologist had gone into there and saw quartz feldspar porphyry with sericite alteration and sulfides. And that became a critical piece of the puzzle. But it wasn't the first piece. They say we keep coming back to why did they start there in the first place? And then the aeromagnetic uh, feature is rendered there in the bottom left. So that's really what started the process off. But one of the geologists that worked with the company, I asked them, I said, well, what about the aeromag? I hear, you know, my father-in-law says the geochem, one of the other geologists says the geology. What really was important? And he laughed. He says, the aeromag told us how big it was. He says, we didn't know what it was, but we knew it had significant size. So that kept us motivated because in that environment, and I can't point, use the pointer because there isn't one, at the bottom southeast end of that arrow mag anomaly is an island with scar mineralization on it. If you had interpreted that entire anomaly to be the same, it wouldn't have been economic interest. But the thing was, all the other companies that looked at that deposit or looked at that opportunity, the Placers, the Narandas, the Kaminkos, Nobody had a porphyry copper in Vancouver Island. They dismissed it as irrelevant. So they had the magic fault across which there's no mineralization. So a relatively junior company coming up from the States with no porphyry experience whatsoever was able to capitalize on this by pulling these various bits of this mouse story together. So that to me was, uh, uh, there's a little better rendering of those things, uh, elements I'm talking about. Uh, but in the official case history, Aeromag is defined as a data set, but it plays no role in the discovery. It is silent, error of emission. But when you talk to the people involved, it clearly was very important at a number of steps in the discovery process. And I think this shows the subjectivity of much of the recording of histories that we have. And we'll make, we might hear one or two more from uh, gentleman in the back who's got some interesting stories as well. So get together guys, figure out, you might find an ore body, but uh, it's important to document it properly as to how we got there. So that's my piece, thank you.